we shall continue with our series entitled, Written with the Finger of God. We are examining the law of God. We are doing that within a covenantal context. How God redeems man within his covenant and what place the law of God has within that covenant that God has created in which he and man can walk together. Man serving his God. We are also looking at how the Puritans developed this as to a standard by which we are to live our lives. And so we're looking at the Westminster Confession of Faith Larger Catechism, examining the Ten Commandments. This is number Sermon 51, and we are still looking at the negative aspect of the first commandment, dealing with what sins are forbidden in the first commandment. Our sermon text is Deuteronomy chapter 9, verses 10 through 11. Then the Lord delivered to me two tablets of stone written with the finger of God. And on them were all the words which the Lord had spoken to you on the mountain from the midst of the fire in the day of the assembly. And it came to pass at the end of forty days and forty nights that the Lord gave me the two tablets of stone, the tablets of the covenant. Shall we look to the Lord our God in prayer? Our Holy Father, we thank you for the privilege that we have to come and to worship you upon this, your most holy day. We ask, O God, that you will give us insight and understanding to the teaching of thy commandments as they apply to our lives, as they were set forth in the writings of the Westminster Divines, as they exegetically considered them from the Holy Scripture. And so, Father, it is thy word that we are following in our understanding of these commandments in light of the larger context of thy special revelation. So, Father, we ask now that in this hour you would give us eyes to see, ears to hear, and a heart to receive what your spirit and word would teach us. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. We are, again, as I said, turning our attention back to the first commandment. And we are still in question number 105 of the larger catechism, which states, what are the sins forbidden in the first commandment? And their answer is, the sins forbidden in the first commandment are atheism, in denying or not believing, a God, atheist, excuse me, and in having or worshiping more gods than one, or with any other instead of the true God, the not having and avouching him for God and our God, the omission or neglect of anything do him, required in this commandment, ignorance, forgetfulness, misapprehensions, false opinions, unworthy and wicked thoughts of him, bold and curious searching into his secrets, all profaneness, hatred of God, self-love, self-seeking, and all other inordinate and immoderate settings of our mind, will or affection upon other things, and taking them off from him in whole or in part, vain credulity, unbelief, heresy, misbelief, distrust, despair, incorrigibleness, and insensibleness under judgments, hardness of heart, pride, presumption, carnal security, tempting of God, using unlawful means, and trusting in lawful means, carnal delights and joys, corrupt, blind, and indiscreet zeal, lukewarmness, and deadness in 
the things of God, estranging ourselves and apostatizing from God, praying or giving any religious worship to saints, angels, or any other creature, all compacts, consulting with the devil and hearkening to his suggestions, making men the lords of our faith and conscience, sliding and despising God and his commands, resisting and grieving the spirit, discontent and impatience at his dispensations, charging him foolishly for the evils he inflicts upon us, and ascribing the praise of any good we either are, have, or can do to fortune, idols, ourselves, or any other creature. Now we are continuing at looking at these things that the Westminster Divines have noted of the sins that we are to ensure we are not involved in or have them as a part of our life in our worship of God. The first commandment is dealing with our God, having the one true God, and in no way delineating from him any honor or power or dignity that belongs to him. And so we have a duty and responsibility to consider that as we are continuing through this. These are many things about how we ought to think about our God, how we are to worship and serve him. Each and every day of our life, consider the fact we have only come this far in the first commandment. There are still nine more. How much is our life to be flooded with the word of God, to be a part of our conscious lifestyle that we live? It's not easy. There is much, there is much to be considered in what God has called us to be as his children. Well, the next thing that the divines were speaking of to us is in particular the phrase estranging ourselves and apostatizing from God. This means what is sometimes called, as we know in evangelical circles, backsliding or the falling away from God. Isaiah 1, 4 through 5, Isaiah the prophet writes, Alas, sinful nation, a people laden with iniquity, a brood of evildoers, children who are corruptors. They have forsaken the Lord. They have provoked to anger the Holy One of Israel. They have turned away backward. That is to say, they have slidden back. They have turned away from God. It's where we kind of get the concept of they have slid back or backsliding. Why should you stricken gain? You will revolt more and more. The whole head is sick and the whole heart faints. Now this... And Isaiah is what happens when professing Christians lose interest in the things of God and gives up even the formal profession of Christianity, or if you will, of their personal faith in Christ and in the trust they have of their God. It is that which we call the backsliding. It is an action that sees someone go backwards rather than forwards. They turn away from God to the world. They no longer 
feel bound or obligated to serve God, to honor Him, to give all integrity unto who He is as the sovereign Redeemer God. And as a result, they have turned themselves away from Him and thus from His Word, and they have changed the way they think and the way that they live. Such a person, we would say, has hardened themselves. He is not concerned about spiritual things any longer. He fails to make use of the means of grace, that is, of the things God has set forth in his word, which is, of course, the Bible itself, the sacraments that God has given, or prayer. Now, let me stop for a minute and let me say this does not mean that a person is going to become necessarily an atheist. As a good humanist, they might be an atheist. Or, if you will, they might be a person who says, Oh, I still have religion. Oh, I still have a personal thing. I, their profession of faith today, it's popular to say. I don't believe in, in organized, personal type religion but I am a spiritual person. I have no idea what that means. I don't think they do either. Somehow in their thinking and in their theology, they believe as long as I think something that is extra human, something just a little greater, doesn't necessarily have to be infinite, could be a greater finite being, Kind of like the Greek gods. I have a religion, whatever that may be, however they think, and they'll often say, well, it's not organized. Well, I'm not sure exactly then what it is that your religion is. And I have a personal spirituality about myself. But I have done away with the things that I once professed. Those things dealing with the God of the Bible, of what his word commands of us, and of his son, Jesus Christ. I no longer adhere to those things. That is a person who has clearly hardened his heart against God. He has backslidden. Do not mistake in this for necessarily the way that someone in modern fundamentalism would say uh, brother so and so he has his faith and he believes in God and he believes in his salvation he's got his fire insurance papers but you know he's just gotten off the farm and what we got to do is get him back on the Indian reservation and get him back to doing what he's supposed to be doing and so that's so their idea of backsliding it equates with this doctrine they created called the carnal Christian He's become carnal in the way that he deals with things. He doesn't go to church. He will not pray. He doesn't read his Bible. He doesn't do any of the things that are the means of grace. He doesn't take the Lord's Supper. He has backslidden, but he's still saved. That's not what the Scripture is talking about. Backsliding, turning away from God, literally means you are renouncing what you have believed in. Much like the parable of the sower. You remember the seed was sown on hardened ground and the sun burned it up. The next seed was sown and the, uh, the uh, I think it was ravens or it was some kind of, eagles came or the birds came and they ate away the corn. And then you had the seed that was also put forth and that grew up and it seemed to take root. But then the thorns and thistles all grew up and it just, the weeds just choked it out and it died. That's what this is. There has seemed to be life at one time. There was this profession of faith. I have become a child of God. But the reality is they only have fooled themselves they had not fooled God they were never a child of God 
They were not following the things of God. And time alone was going to demonstrate that the true nature of their heart and of their heart's desire would come to pass. And they would turn from their God and they would turn from the things God had ordained for us to walk therein. The fruit of the Spirit, those works that naturally are a part of the necessity of our salvation. So there is this idea of a carnal Christian, one who can have faith, but he doesn't have any fruit. He isn't producing. Scripture never teaches something like that. He who has true faith produces good works, fruits in his life. Not going to be perfect, but he's going to be consistent. He's going to be persistent to do what God has called him to do. And that is to follow the practices and the teachings that God has set forth in his word for a believer. We should realize that Christians who have truly been born again by the Spirit of God, they're not going to totally or permanently fall away from God. That's an impossibility. But they are not going to live their lives out away from God for years. He who is truly a child of God will be disciplined of God. God will bring him back to the fold. He will cause him through his trial and adversity to repent and come back to obedience unto God. However, even a born Christian at times can, as it were, fall into sin and in a sense of that estrangement, to a degree, we would say he is not walking with God. For example, just as Peter did when he denied Christ three times in one night. Another form of estranging ourselves and apostatizing uh, from God is to give up real Christianity and become a member of a false cult or a false religion. So there is unequivocally those who fall completely away, backslide out of the faith, literally say, I am not continuing in this religion and faith, this practice, the things of God any longer. And they turn and they walk away. That's not to say they won't be religious. They may stay religious. They may speak about spiritual things, but they do not speak about the things that God speaks about in his word. And there are those who, to agree, like Peter, will deny Christ. Hard to imagine a person can deny Christ, and yet he's still of Christ. And yet what happens he is brought to repentance. He cannot live in his sin. And so he is brought back to the fold by God. Whether it is through a certain act or discipline, whatever trial adversity he may bring into life. But I assure you this, if he is a child of God, he's never comfortable living that life. I often have repeated, I don't know if you've heard it because I don't know how many times I've ever repeated it before you in the last years. J. Vernon McGee had one time an illustration that I thought was outstanding. And he said, you know, you have the young man who wanted his inheritance and to go on his way. He goes and he finally has spent everything and the next thing you realize is he's in the, the hog Troughed, as it were, with the rest of the pigs, eating. 
because he had spent everything he had, and that's all he had. And he said, you know, even my servants eat better than, than the hogs do at my father's home. And so he returns, the parable of the lost son returning back to his father. And McGee said, we know that story, but let me give you the back side of the parable, which I always thought was an interesting thing. When the young man returned to his father's house, he took with him a new friend that he had met, Mr. Pig. He brought him from the trogoff, where he was eating food with him, both of them sticking their head in the trough, eating whatever food was thrown in, slop, as it were. He takes him back to his father's house, and he tells his father, not only am I here, but I brought my friend with me. And so his father has him clean him up and I tie a bow around the pig's neck and he's all spotless and clean and he and the, his friend, the father, son, come to the dinner table. They set him down and they say to him, Mr. Pig, here is your food and here is your fork and your spoon and your knife and if you will, please show good manners at the table. And of course, you know, the pig is not happy. Why would he not be happy? Because he's not allowed to live in his environment. He likes eating in the trough that he has always been fed in. Just throw in the food, stick your nose in, eat to your heart's content. But this is not what they're asking him. The son has returned. He's willing to do what the father told him. But his friend, Mr. Pig, will not do it. Why? It is outside of his nature. It's very important for us to realize sometimes people come to the father's house and they clean themselves up for a time. And they want to be a part of what is going on, but the reality is they are out of their environment. They are not happy. Because you see, they're not a son, they're a pig. And they want to live and act like a pig and not like a son. And that's something we need to always remind herself. There is an expectation on us who have been renewed by the Spirit of God, who have put our faith, our hope, our trust in Christ, that as we have been transformed into children of God and we are given a new nature, a nature that seeks to conform to the commandments of God, that we are living to those standards, those practices. We are taking advantage of the things that God has given to us to help ourselves remain faithful to the calling that we have. But there are many who are going to come to the table of feasting. They're going to come to that banquet. They're going to come and they're going to want to fellowship and they're going to want to participate. But the fellowship and the participation is beyond their nature. And while they want it, they want, quote, to be religious and they want, quote, to be spiritual and they want to fit in, but they don't have the nature to do it. And you got to know the difference between sons and pigs. That's just required. Well, the divines continue and say that when we are to give religious worship, it is to be worship that is not given to saints, to angels, or other creatures. It is wrong, according to the teaching of Scripture, to give worship to anyone 
but God. That's what this first commandment, of course, clearly is all about. You cannot worship saints. You cannot worship angels or any other creature. God does not allow us to do so. Or even icons in that sense. You cannot worship paintings or things that God himself has not given you permission to use in worship. Romans 10, 13 through 14, Paul says, Whoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? The preaching of the word is the means of God to call people to Christ through the outward call of the gospel while God is effectively working in them by his spirit to call them through that outward means in the transformation of their heart. Here in Acts 10, 25 through 26, we're told, as Peter was coming in, Cornelius met him and fell down at his feet. And worshipped him. But Peter lifted him up, saying, Stand up, I myself am also a man. You cannot worship me. I am a man too. I am created. I have no greater standing than you. The only standing that I have is in Christ Jesus in relationship to my God. Since no saint, since no angel, nor any other creature ever created us, therefore they have no claim on our religious devotion. Therefore we cannot worship them. They did not redeem us from sin. And therefore our gratitude for salvation is not due to them, but is due to to God alone. They are not mediators between God and man, for there is only one mediator, and the scripture says that is the Lord Jesus Christ. No person can worship those saints and angels and still give God the devotion that is due him. When you remove from all or in part, says the divines, what is commanded of you to give honor and integrity in your devotion to him, when you give it to someone else, then you delineate the, the person and the position that our God holds. He will not allow another to do that. There is but one who represents the triune God, and that is he who was made manifest among us in the incarnation, the second person of the Godhead born in order that he might give us life, God redeeming us, and we can give no worship due to another in any form. And any time you're being asked to do so, it is wrong. Now, we're not talking about loyalty there is always a loyalty to the word of God. There's a loyalty to give to those who serve God. That's not talking about. It's talking about worshiping them. And it's wrong. We are not to worship anyone but our God. But we must do it in the way that he has ordained it for us. And so there is place for respect for the elders, for the deacons, for those who are serving and helping to serve, to teach you, to dispense to you the very means of God's grace. It's okay to have loyalty there. But we are called to be faithful but to one God. He alone requires our full 
devotion to him. No one rules over us. Nothing is to allow to control us, whether it be anything in this life as a being or creature, whatever the case may be, or in material things themselves. They are never to supplant our devotion and loyalty that we are to give unto our God. And so it is, we must be careful. To whom we give devotion and honor to in the worship of truth. And the truth is the word, and the word leads us to him who hath created us, and him who has redeemed us through the incarnation of his own son, and by the power of his spirit, and that he alone, the God of the scripture, is worthy of our devotion. Let us always take care to understand that. Do not supplant that with the idea concerning other things. Keep it in that perspective because there are many other things that we need to look at. What is the duty of the church? How does the church discipline and what is its authority? To, does discipline and calling the individuals of the church to serve God according to Scripture and to bind them to the word. Does that supplant their devotion to God? No. And we'll see that as we move on. But it's important for you to understand what he wants. You don't serve the pastor. You don't serve the deacons. You don't serve the elders. You don't serve any teacher. No one supplants God who's to have the devotion alone in servitude as the one whom you have your faith, your hope, and your trust in. That is so very important to us. We who are reformed, we put a, a prime, as it were, emphasis on this very thing. One of the things that we argue more than anything else, no one can bind your conscience except God. He binds it how? Through the preaching of the word, that is teaching that is consistent with the word of God. He binds it through the table of the Lord. He tells you to examine yourself, but he tells the elders of the church to fence the table. If someone's living in open sin in their life, they are forbidden to come to protect the integrity of the supper and at the same time not to allow them to whitewash their, quote, profession of faith by ignoring the teaching of Scripture. And so it is, they are be, to be bound through that work. And the other way we bind people is what? We bind them through prayer and we bind them in particular through church discipline. When we say to a person, you want to be a member of this church? And then the answer is yes. Then we have them stand and we say, will you follow the teaching of this church as it is defined in our theology? As we believe, it is taught from the word of God. Will you submit to its authority? Will you submit to the way that it exercises its duties in ecclesiology, that is in church practice and government. That's a part of that. Then comes all those other things that we do. We bind by the word when we preach. That's why you're to be here every Sunday. I can't tell you to wear blue socks. It's not in the scripture. I can bind you to what is truth. I can never bind you to error. And it's not me that is binding you. I'm the messenger who's telling you this is what is commanded of you. But if you want to live your life apart from that, then as one who has that office and duty, I will either keep you from the table along with the other elders 
or we will remove you from the church. That's binding authority. But that isn't the ultimate authority. The ultimate authority is that God is to be served in him alone. He binds your conscience and mind. But he has a church and he has an officers that he has given to his church to carry out his work here on earth. We need to wake up and truly have a greater respect for what the divines have taught us concerning the very nature and essence of his church. Well, let us consider these things. They're very important to us. This is how God wants us to be, not falling back away from our faith, but pursuing it. Our calling is to pursue the high things of God, to be holy like God is holy. In that sense, he is so different from everything else. We, too, are to be different from the world in our calling unto him. And we are to pursue that faith, those good works, perseverance of the saints, sanctification in our calling to that high and holy calling God has given us in Christ and his righteousness. We are to consider how that we are to make sure our worship is not that which violates this commandment, but conforms to this commandment. That we are to serve the God of this scripture and we're to do it in the way that the total aspect of worship is to be unto him. I would like to take this time, but I don't have the time right now, to just go into a whole series on worship and say, how does this affect the first commandment? I say to you, whatever is commanded of us to do in the totality of understanding his word, we are given the duty to do. What is ever explicit, implicit, or by good and necessary deduction may be deduced from the word we are to implement and to do in our worship of God to conform to his law, his commandment, that he is our only true God, to give ourselves to none another, not to a saint, not to an angel, nor to any other creature or any material thing. Nothing is to stand in the way of our pursuit of our high calling in Christ to follow and worship and devote ourselves unto God, to recognize his holiness, the integrity that he has as creator and as redeemer of men. Let us give ourselves to this very thing that we would always come back and judge ourselves by his standard, the word of God, that we are standing right. We are standing correct. We are standing where he wants us to stand. And in doing so, he is well pleased with us. Shall we pray?